Want an easy way to see if you could save money on car insurance? GEICO gives you three. Call 1-800-947-AUTO, go online to GEICO.com, or stop by the GEICO office nearest you. Three ways you could save 15% or more. Ahead on the best 60 minutes of your day, while LeBron and the Cavs simply look to get above 500 tonight on ESPN, are we looking at the present and future kings of the East in Boston? What tomorrow night's clash with the champs will tell us about these seas. In L.A., it's Alonzo who is trusting the process. Why he'll shoot well enough to actually play the fourth tonight against Ben Simmons and the Sixers. Certainly can't shoot worse. It could be worse. He could be Leangelo. I don't feel sorry for myself. And I've learned my lessons from this big mistake. Did UCLA punish its trio of shoplifting freshmen harshly enough? And why Baker Mayfield already has done enough to lock up the Heisman, while a win over Michigan will lock up a spot in the top four for Wisconsin. All that and so much more next on SportsCenter. That's right, it's the six with Michael and Jamel instead of Michael or Jamel, LOL. Here's a look at tonight's six at six, starting with Ezekiel Elliott throwing in the towel and sitting for six games. Uh, yeah, Ezekiel Elliott has decided to drop any remaining appeals and will serve his entire six-game suspension for domestic violence. According to Elliott's agents, Rocky Arsenault and Frank Salzano, Elliott arrived at this decision after consulting with his legal team and the NFLPA uh, after reviewing the recent second court decisions. Now, he's already missed the Cowboys game against Atlanta. Now he'll nick. He'll miss the next five. He'll be eligible for the Cowboys' final two regular season games and the postseason, of course, if Dallas makes it. The suspension is expected to cost Elliott about $600,000 in salary. And here's a statement from Elliott's agents. This decision in no way uh, admits any admission of wrongdoing. And Mr. Elliott is pleased that the legal fight mounted by him and his team resulted in the disclosure of many hidden truths regarding this matter, as well as public exposure of the NFL's mismanagement of its disciplinary process. Mr. Elliott will maximize this time away from the game and come back even stronger both on and off the field. He intends to release a final personal statement in the upcoming weeks. And until then, we'll have no further comment. Here's more from Adam Schefter. Thank you, Jamil and Michael. The on-again, off-again, on-again, off-again saga of Ezekiel Elliott that has gone on since August when the six-game suspension was handed down is off again. Ezekiel Elliott finally has dropped his appeal. And the reason he did it is because legally he knew that he had very little chance of having this appeal resolved before the six games had been served anyway. His appeal was scheduled to be heard on December 1st, at which point four games would have been served by that point anyway. By the time the courts would have figured it out, the six games would have passed. So rather than go on with the legal fight, he decided to drop that appeal now, which means the Dallas Cowboys will have to figure out a way to stay alive and stay in playoff contention without their star standout running back. For now, the Zeke Elliott case is off. He will be back in the lineup December 24th against Seattle. But we have not heard the last of this story. I promised you that. Back to you. So that's the court system analysis from Adam Schefter. Let's talk about the court of public opinion. As we've talked about before, those that believe that he, in fact, committed acts of domestic violence are going to believe it regardless of whether he continued to fight or not. So even if he says this is in no way an admission of any wrongdoing, people have already made up their minds about it. Those who remember that this is, in fact, about domestic violence and not just Article 46, which brings me to the part about, in the statement, the NFL's mismanagement of the disciplinary process, exposing it. Does it matter? We know that it's a kangaroo court. We know that they don't do the right thing when it comes to disciplinary players. We learned that with Deflategate. But they can't seem to not just fight but beat City Hall. Yeah, um, look, I knew... Not to get too uh, caught up when Ezekiel Elliott would have sort of those minor victories that he's had along the way where the suspension would be off on. Uh, We've gone through that back and forth since this decision was handed down in August because eventually this is what the NFL does. They wear you out. Uh, They did the same thing with Tom Brady. And uh, look, um, for him at this point, the reputation uh, or the harm to his reputation has been done. And I knew that it would get to this point where he'd have to really decide whether or not it was worth it. The shame of it will be. 
again, if he actually didn't do this to have served this suspension and to have this done to his reputation, we have to wonder whether or not this process really has gotten to the root of the truth. And real quick, just goes without saying, if he did do it, his reputation doesn't matter. Yeah, on paper, this Cavs wanted to match up. Doesn't seem so tantalizing. Who knew this would eventually devolve into a 7-17 and versus a 5-17, and but the Cavs and LeBron there trying to get back over 500, and they face the perfect team to try to accomplish that since Jordan. Michael Jordan, that is, became the Hornets majority owner in 2010. LeBron is 23 and 1 against the Hornets, mm. by far his best record against any team during that span. All right, so Cassidy Hubbard uh, joins us now. So you had the Cavs, they were in a playful, uh, and in the case of LeBron Cassidy, a petty move going into the Knicks game. <laughs> Afterward, with help from Arthur, the Cavs took to IG to let us know that they were feeling pretty good about themselves. So question is, what's the mood around the Cavs coming off of two straight wins, albeit, of course, over the Mavs and the Knicks? Yeah, so if I were to kind of come up with an Arthur picture meme for the mood this morning before shoot-around, I, I, I think it would be like a little tired Arthur with a closed mouth smile. Not an open mouth smile, probably a closed mouth smile. Because uh, overall, I mean, the Cavs are positive. They've won actually three of their last four games. And I asked Jay Crowder, you know, if that game in New York, that emotional win, the subway ride, the Arthur memes, if that was a bonding experience. And he said... Of course it was. And he also said that this is the most team oriented team he's ever been on. And, you know, he, it's just a little while after Kevin Love said that they were unfamiliar with each other. So it seems like the Cavs are going in the right direction. As far as LeBron is concerned, I asked him this morning, I go, coming off of that emotional comeback win in New York, the shade he threw at Phil Jackson, the clap backing with Ennis Cantor, all of that. I, I haven't checked to see if he has any petty posts today. I mean, Last that's our knowledge. There, okay, there wasn't. Uh, he told me, basically, uh, we're on national television. That's all the motivation we need. You never want to be nasty on <laughs> national television. Well, that's so, good news for us. Uh, exactly. <laughs> that's a, you know what? I said thank you after that. Uh, I, I also think the Cavs, they, they want him to be nasty, not nasty. So uh, we'll see what they do tonight as they uh, close up this uh, road trip. I like right, the Cass. differentiation with the long A. Exactly. That makes sense. All right, now to our other game. Lonzo Ball and Ben Simmons meet for the first time in the regular season. After that Cavs game tonight on ESPN, and while the two share an affinity for passing the ball, their rookie seasons couldn't be going any differently. Simmons is leading all rookies in points, rebounds, and assists, and the Sixers appear ready to take the next step to the play. <coughs> Meanwhile, Lonzo Ball shooting has been fairly dreadful. He's shooting just 31% from the floor, including 25% from three-point range. My man, Ohm, Young Masu. Y'all want to talk about? I, we don't want to talk about last night. Y'all 37, no, Michigan see, State. See, no, y'all. I'm, 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 okay. You're being real petty okay. right now. Just, just, I'm I'm gonna, I got a bone to pick with Magic. I'm going to have to ask Magic <laughs> what happened last night, and I'm sure he'll break it down for me. But. Uh, you know, when it comes to Lonzo's shooting, Jamel, I was listening to Pebbles on my way here to the stadium and wondering. Girlfriend? That, uh, yeah, Pebbles giving. The Lakers are going to give Lonzo Ball the benefit of the doubt here, okay? Oh. With his shot. You like that, Jamel? I that do. one's for you. Um, <laughs> look, Magic Johnson has said. We're gonna let we're gonna let the kid keep shooting. We are not gonna mess with his shot. And of course, the Lakers can't. They have no other choice. They have to let him keep shooting. He's shooting about 31% from the field, but 25% from three. I watched him in shoot around today. He was uh, doing a shooting contest with Kyle Kuzma. He was burying a lot of threes from the wing, and he usually does this in practice. But when it comes to game time and when defenses are sagging on those pick and rolls and they're giving him the three, they're not falling. Now, the other night in Phoenix, he did have a couple that went in and out. He says he's going to keep shooting. And, of course, Magic says, let's just see if this improves. If it doesn't improve, then this summer we may have to look at fixing the shot. You might have to look at fixing your rotation, though. Do you really ride into work listening to Pebbles, Look, dog? Like, come on. I mean, I, I, I grew up on Pebbles, too, but you ain't listening to Pebbles. That was a great reference. the foremost 90s R&B aficionado. Yeah, Pebbles, you could do better. Mercedes we'll talk Boyd. about this some other time. <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect. You know, you he do don't better. understand all I understand right. it. I'm just saying, you can't, that's not hype music to go to work. Anyway. Thank you. All right, on Thank to you. the <laughs> under, other story involving the Ball family. UCLA is suspending freshman Langelo Ball, Cody Riley, and Jalen Hill indefinitely for allegedly shoplifting during the team's trip to China, where they were held after being released on bail. The players finally returned from China yesterday and today at a news conference they each read statements apologizing for the incident. I'm a young man, however it's not an excuse for making a really stupid decision. I also like everyone to know that this does not define who I am. My family raised me better than that 
and I'm going to make myself a better person from here on out. I'd also like to thank President Trump and the United States government for the help that they provided as well. I'm grateful to be back home, and I'll never make a mistake like this again. Trust is earned. It isn't just given. These three young men will remain suspended indefinitely from our program as we work through the review process with the university's Office of Student Conduct. During that indefinite suspension, they will not travel with the team, nor will they suit up for home games. All right, Arash Marchese, he was with the team when the, first, first, the, first, the story first broke, excuse me, in China and was in L.A. for today's press conference. Arash, what are the chances this indefinite suspension lasts the whole season? There is a chance. Uh, Jamel, there is a current debate currently going on within university uh, officials about how long this suspension will last. There is a segment that believes it should be for half the season, which means that they would be back for the beginning of conference play. And then there are some who believe that they should be suspended for the entire season. And if that's the case, how soon do you let them know that and kind of allow them to transfer if they want? But again, from everyone I've talked to, there is definitely a chance that they could be suspended for the entire season. But again, that is a debate that is currently happening. Well, I'll just say this. Well, there's two games or 10 games, guys. They've been detained in China, probably scared to death. They've been embarrassed. They've apologized and they're being used as political props right now. So they've learned their lesson. No matter how long they have to sit, they've learned their lesson. But Half the season or entire season? That'd be steep. But, Rosh, we appreciate it, man. Thank you. So much to do about nothing then. Mike Zimmer is sticking with Case Keenum as a starter for Sunday's game between the 7-2 and Vikings and 7-2 and Rams. Teddy Bridgewater will remain the backup. I remain puzzled as to why there was intrigue leading up to this announcement, given Keenum had led the Vikings to five straight wins and is among the league's total QBR leaders. Regardless, at least Zimmer arrived at the right decision, the only decision. Man, that's, that's stuff that you guys talk about. I mean, I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to win ball games. I'm... I'm doing the best I can, and uh, you know that's showing up every day and doing my job. That's uh, protecting the football, obviously. That's learning from my mistakes. That's uh, continuing to do things well that I do well. But um, you know, I think all that stuff—that's just storylines for you guys to talk about. So I don't pay attention to it. Courtney Cronin, can you answer my question as to why this was even a question or a consideration as to who was going to start at seven and two against the Rams, given Teddy Bridgewater hasn't played in what 22 months? Yeah, it's certainly not a question, Michael, in week 11. Case has led this team to where they're at right now, first place, top of the NFC North. He's got the, all the momentum, and they're going to continue to ride that. I think it becomes a question, though, when you're looking down the line. They've got four more games on the road in the second half of the season. And then if you're looking towards the playoffs, who's going to be able to get you a win on the road in the postseason? Is it Case Keenum or is it Teddy Bridgewater? Right now, they don't know with Bridgewater. Mike Zimmer did say that he is completely healthy. Otherwise, he wouldn't be on the sideline dressed out. But how are you going to know what he can do? At some point this season, it seems inevitable that the Vikings are going to have to get Bridgewater some action on the field because, because that's certainly an experiment you don't want come week 17 and looking towards the postseason to throw him into the mix if things all of a sudden don't start working with Case Keenum like they are now. All right, Courtney, we appreciate it. See, that's what it comes down to. As I mentioned, he is among the league leaders in total QBR. As a matter of fact, he's second among dudes still playing, Jamel. This, this comes down to being a Case Keenum thing. I love Teddy Bridgewater, love his story, but the fact that it's even a discussion at this point is basically you're just looking for a reason. Because Case Keenum. Exactly. Yeah, there's an like, expectation that the make bottom sense is going to me. fall out. It doesn't make sense to well, me Well, it does all. make sense. Teddy Bridgewater is their franchise guy. He's going to get the benefit of the doubt in any and all situations. What does that matter now when he hasn't played for this franchise in over a year? It matters still because they still feel like he's their guy. A a horrific injury happened, and I think they still want to see whether or not uh, he can still play. He's still the guy that they thought that he was. So So, you want to see whether he's a guy, but you don't want to keep winning? You want to keep the train rolling? No, I think you could actually do both, but make no mistake about it. Because he is Case Keenum, no disrespect. (laughs) But? But he (laughs) is going to have a shorter leash and not the same cushion 
and say if the situation were reversed. That's fine. I'm not saying Case Keenum should be treated like he's Tom Brady and he can't lose his job at all. What I'm saying is if his name weren't Case Keenum, I told you he's completing 65% with 11 touchdowns, mm-hmm. it was third in total QBR with a 92.6 mm-hmm. rating, and they won five straight games, you wouldn't be trying to replace him with a guy. Look, the Vikings more than anybody know the, 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 the need for a capable backup quarterback. That's why they're on Case Keenum right now. Correct. It may be a moot point. They may need him, Teddy Bridgewater, that is, sooner rather than later for whatever reason. But you don't go looking for a reason. If Case Keenum performs poorly, then you turn to Teddy and the sky is blue. I, that's, that shouldn't be a conversation like a week-to-week thing. Like, oh, we'll tell you who our quarterback is on Wednesday. Your quarterback's the guy has been for the last five games. Well. Again, it's because it's Case Keenum. No disrespect. You've been trying to. You, no, I mean. Only Teddy Bridgewater no. was activated last week. Behind the scenes, you're like, when's Teddy playing? This is the situation they're in. There was a quarterback change in Buffalo. First year Bills coach Sean McDermott changing his mind since Sunday and Monday and announcing today that rookie Nathan Peterman will replace Tyrod Taylor, who doesn't play defense, and given his contract, is almost certain to be playing for another team next season. Then again, the writing has been on the wall since the offseason for Tyrod. So the 5-4 and four Bills, one of six teams in the AFC with a winning record, turns their fifth-round pick out of pit. It is always and will forever, forever for the time that I'm here, will be about becoming the best team that we can possibly become. And uh, we are made for more than five and four, and I've, I've come here to be more than five and four. Just disappointed. Uh, that's one of the feelings, but definitely just disappointed. Like I said, I don't agree with the decision, but uh, ultimately Coach McDermott um, has a vision for this team, uh, what he feels is best for the team, as well as the owners and GM. So um, I have to move forward and uh, continue to be the teammate and the, the leader that I am from a different role. Are you shocked or surprised by this? Yes. All right. So just who is Nathan Peterman? Bills took him again in the fifth round of this year's draft. Eighth quarterback taken. Will be the 17th Bills starting quarterback since Jim Kelly retired after the 96th season. Played 11 snaps last week in a blowout loss to the Saints. Went 7-10 for 79 yards and a touchdown. Damian Woody needs no introduction. How do you feel about this decision? Right one? I, I, I see where McDermott's coming from. How about you? You do? Oh, 100%. Okay. Well, he's not his guy. <laughs> Precisely. He's not, he's not his guy. Politics. I mean, that's, Politics that's, is usual. that's basically what it is. I mean, you, if you go back and look, you know, in, in training camp in the preseason, I mean, he was playing him behind patchwork lines. Who, who throws their starting quarterback behind a patchwork offensive line? The one whose contract they reworked anyway. Right, exactly. I mean, he was in a training camp battle with Nathan Peterman and, and, and other quarterbacks on the, on the roster. Um, so th- that, that further tells you that he was never their guy. They were just looking for the right moment that they could, you know, so pull him from the line. the playoffs, huh? Because like, right. it could not be your well, guy, like, and it could be politics as usual, but you have to win. And guess what? No one cares about those politics, Sean McDermott, if you don't win. So why would you do something that is just so s- simple-minded? I'll tell you why. Because this is a move that only a rookie coach, coach would make with an eye toward the future. They've been accumulating draft picks, making right. a lot of trades, some for now, some for later. And they have done a good job in that regard. You, correct. You, so, could, you could say right now that they're improving themselves by – potentially losing games because their draft picks will become, will, will become higher. But I, I don't picks. think they're tanking. I think this no, is, I don't think they're tanking, but, tanking but what, at all. He said we're here for more than five wins, okay? I was here for more than that. They could try to make the playoffs with Tyrod Taylor. I think this is what he's thinking. They could try to make the playoffs with Tyrod Taylor, win Buffalo's usual seven, eight games, maybe make it. But what's the ceiling? I think they know that not only is he not their guy as in their hand-selected guy Tyrod Taylor is, but he's not the guy that can take them to the next level. So they're looking at it like, you know what? Our defense is falling apart before our eyes. We may be 5-4 and four in the thick of this, but we're not good enough in the grand scheme of things. Maybe in the short term, but definitely not in the long term. So you know what you do? You go to somebody that maybe can win now, but you want to find out. You're talking about Teddy Bridgewater so to find that, out. That, you want to find out if he can win later. Sense. It makes sense in that instead of going with the status quo and playing like your job is on the line as a coach and right. trying to win now and maybe make the playoffs, knowing that Tyrod Taylor is not the long-term answer, you go to somebody who well, you, know, well, you know what? This, this is the way I equate it. You know in the NBA, the worst place you could be is like in the middle. Mediocre. Right. It's be mediocre. I think if you're a Buffalo right now, it's like, yeah, all you know what? Be mediocre right, we don't, we're, you know, at this point right now, the, the best place we could be is mediocre. We'd rather just throw, throw the young guy in there, see what he has. We have draft picks now where if, if we don't see what we like, then we can always go and out there. I'm not saying Tyrod's the that, problem, and this exactly. is a raw deal, but he's no, no, certainly no. not the solution either. Well, he's not the solution because they haven't created many solutions around him. And so that's the part where I find to be ultimately hilarious about all this is that they've made him the fall guy, made him seem as if he's the problem. Mm-hmm. They haven't adequately built around him. He doesn't have the weapons he needs. They say, oh, but you're the problem. He always also has his flaws, but didn't I start by saying politics? Yeah. 
Okay, so it's a, it's a mixture of both. It's not okay. just practice. But, you know, I mean, but, it's, but it's also it's politics. Like these, what, that's how you get fired. Well, I mean, cl- clearly this is all the def- – the, like you said earlier, the defense fell apart. No, no, I mean, the pass, these guys pass, pass, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, they traded away – like yeah, four or five guys yeah. throughout the season. So yeah. obviously this was the right on the wall for Tyron Taylor. <laughs> Franchise guy right there. Computer, execute 12.4p operation. Optimizing algorithm. Running encryption packet alpha. Night, night. Oh, I don't feel so good. What? What is it, computer? Is it hot in here? It feels hot in here? I feel a little clammy. I should lie down or s- something. A computer with a virus? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. Those oysters Rockefeller were a mistake. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Tory Kluber tied a bow on his 2017 season with another Cy Young Award. Led the AL with a 2-2-5 ERA. Joined Mike Garcia as the only Indians player to lead the league in ERA. Made his mark in the second half of the season. That was really different between him and Chris Sale. He fell off, whereas when... Kluber came off the DL in June. Since the start of June, Kluber went 15-2 and with a 1.62 ERA, struck out more than 12 per nine. And, of course, the Indians had that great winning streak. Also won a Cy Young in 2014, which makes him the 19th player in MLB history with multiple Cy Young awards. First Indian player ever to do it. All right, Indians pitcher Corey Kluber now joins us. Uh, Corey, this is your second Cy Young award. You got 28 of 30 first place votes. Nice. Uh, is there a difference between the first one and the second one? And, and what does it mean for you? Uh, I don't know if there's a difference. I mean, they're definitely both special. Uh, they're they're great honors. Um, you know, I think that it's a, a culmination of a long season, a lot of hard work. Um, but, you know, I don't know if there's any difference between the two. Well, you know what Sade said, never as good as the first time. So there's that. Uh, what, will you remember, what will you remember most about this season? Obviously, it didn't end as well as you like, but certainly a lot of special moments along the way. Yeah, you know, I think that uh, when you take a step back and you look at the course of the – of 162 games, you know, I think there are a lot of special moments throughout the season. Um, most noteworthy would probably be the the winning streak, and I think that the way that you know we we won and we played the game during that winning streak, uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun to come to the ballpark every day. It, it is every day with that group. Uh, you know, there's never a dull moment in our clubhouse. But you know, I think it's just the guys that we're around every day. That's those are lasting memories. Now, is it difficult for you? Uh Again, as Mike said, the season didn't end the way you wanted to wanted it to, and especially compared to how last season went. But for you to be recognized uh, for such a, a prestigious achievement, and then kind of balance the fact that you know your season didn't end the way you wanted it to, how do you kind of strike that balance and observing one but still keeping in light the bar- the bigger and larger goal that didn't happen? Yeah, I think that obviously the way the season ended was disappointing for all of us. Um, but I, I think we're already looking forward looking forward to next year. You know, I think that everybody's well into our off season now. Hopefully, everybody's you know kind of got their got their blinders on and looking towards 2018 because I think that uh, we want to we want to have a better finish than we have you know last year and ultimately than we did two years ago as well. You know, I think that everybody's working towards that goal. All right, congratulations on the side and uh, enjoy the off season as best you can. Thanks for joining the six. All right, y'all know I trusted the process, also believed in the plan, but I admit I doubted whether the Celtics overhaul roster would gel quickly enough this season to contend for the East again. And I certainly thought they were out of the conversation when Gordon Hayward went down and out for the season. And yet here they are, winners of 13 straight with the Warriors up next. You know, it's it's definitely an incredible streak we're on. Um, And now comes, uh, you know, the, the whole media frenzy of, Will the streak end and what's going to happen on Thursday and the Golden State Warriors are coming to Boston. So I'm looking forward to that, all that hoopla. Well, Steve Kerr already taking notice. He said, that looks like a team that is going to be at the top of the East for a long time to come. Called them the future of the Eastern Conference. Whether their time is now or the future, that's to be determined. But they sure look like they want it to be right now. Exactly. They got next and now. So let's talk about tomorrow night. It's never too soon to Kyrie's point to start hyping up this matchup. Best two teams uh, in the league record-wise. 13 straight wins for the Celtics. Warriors on a winning streak. I think seven straight, all in by double digits. So let me ask you this. What would a win over the Warriors mean for Boston? How would you look at them if they beat the Warriors at home tomorrow? I think we need to learn how to quantify things by degrees because I think we're usually very all or nothing. And I know for a lot of people with a long NBA season, we're talking about a regular season game in November. And granted, against two very good teams, I think it does mean something. I think it means something for the Celtics. And, look, we all know that in sports, a lot of times it's about narratives. And 
I think a lot of us lowered our expectations of the Celtics once Gordon Hayward went out and this wasn't the team we kind of envisioned challenging, truly challenging LeBron in the East. Well, they said, okay, so you guys going to doubt us? We got something else to show you. And I think that the way that they play both with and without Kyrie, that there is something that this team just has. They have, they have it. They fit together so well and nicely. And so to see if they were able to beat the Warriors while, no, it's not a championship, know that if they, whatever happens to them at the postseason will always be the dominant kind of story of their season. But this is one of those wins, given the streak that they're on, that shows you that what Steve Kerr said is absolutely true. And right. I think a lot of people can see that. This is a team that is trending so far northward, northward that you better get in on it. We map. already knew that they were going to – they had next along with the Sixers. Mm -hmm. They had next in the Eastern Conference. That was the plan. And on behalf of Danny Ainge, I will accept your apology and everybody else. <laughs> I'll accept yours for what? about for what? Kyrie Irving what? not making a good no, move. Well, I'll, no, I'll accept no, yours. No, don't conflate those two things. I'll accept yours I was about in the middle Kyrie of a point Irving. and he we'll had to go because you're petty. No, that's I'm not. I'm not petty. You no, brought it up. I didn't say Kyrie. I was Kyrie. perfectly content to give my analysis. No, and here you go talking about an apology. That's what you did, right? Dang. You know you can't win an argument. Do I clap back or do I focus on the Focus on the I'm not going to make this about me. I'm not going to make it about me. Talk about the Celtics. Talk about the Celtics. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, I'll let you make it about you. Talk about the Celtics. It was always a plan for them to be another dynasty, maybe, and, and, and control the East for the year, for years to come. But this team right here, right now, even without Gordon Hayward, you're right about us lowering our expectations, but let's not be prisoners of those lowered expectations out of the gate. They're more versatile than they were last year. They rebound the heck out of the ball. And that's, saying, that's not saying much compared to last year, but they're a great rebounding team. I know they've had some favorable opponents so far, but you play who you play. Their defense is so devastating and so sound. They're deeper. And those rookies, they're, they're, they're hard to deal with at both ends. Tatum has been amazing down the stretch. So I look at this team, and I know that the Cavs aren't what they're going to be. And I'm not trying to say, oh, this is it. LeBron's not going to make it back to the final. I'm not going there. They don't have IT. They don't have Tristan Thompson. Derrick Rose not healthy. I got it. But why are we – we shouldn't limit this team and what it can do. And I think if they find a way to beat the Warriors, even in the regular season – I'm going to look at them tomorrow. I'm, I look at them now. They're the, they should be the favorite right now. I'm not going to assume what the Cavs are going to become, because just like I should, we should have assumed what the Celtics couldn't do without Gordon Hayward. So right now, the Celtics, especially on defense, have proved worthy of favorite status in the Eastern Conference, and a Warriors win to answer my own question would cement that. Kyrie was not a free agent, and all I said was that was a huge risk by asking away from LeBron when you were winning finals and making shots, and they could have sent him anywhere. Thankfully, they sent him to Boston. I had to get that. Results back. is all that matters. That's what you told me, right? Anyway. Man, Kevin Pelton does amazing work on ESPN.com. But I don't know about all that. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting read. Numbers still never lie. But anyway, I'm like a proud papa talking about Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid. It's like picking between my two favorite children, you know? A as advertised, on the court together, when they've been on the court together, they've scored or assisted on 79% of the team's baskets, outscoring opponents by over 10 points per 100 possessions with them together on the court Second best in the NBA. First best NBA <laughs> analyst and reporter Ramona Shelburne joining us from Sixers Lakers. So Ramona, they're getting along famously, swimmingly, beginning of a beautiful friendship on the court. What about on the court? Is, is, that, is that where it comes from? Like me and Jamel are friends away from the camera. That's how this it, happens. Is look, that the same way with Embiid and Simmons? I, I, I don't know if they have the same chemistry that you and Jamel have. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're very, very different personalities. Like, they, like Joel Embiid is, like, the big clown. Like, he's the big troll, right? He likes to stir the pot. He's loud. Everybody sort of flocks to him. You walk around Philly, he's like the mayor. Whereas Ben Simmons, he's got his headphone on. He's got a lot of pets, right? You read Mark Spears today about how he had a pet rat. Sure did. Like, what? Okay. So, I think one of the things the Sixers really have to figure out is, yes, they're great on the court together, right? I mean, you saw the Kevin Pelton breakdown. They actually passed the ball second most amongst any two players, like, in – that's 88 passes for 100 possessions. So they pass to each other. They play together. But I've talked to, to Brett Brown about this. I've talked to Joel about this, about, to Ben about this. They're still figuring out how to play together. And some of that is because if you haven't noticed, Ben Simmons doesn't really know which hand he likes to shoot with, right? Mm -hmm. Inside, he likes to shoot with the right hand. Outside, he shoots with the left hand, except he doesn't really shoot outside all that much. And so it's kind of hard to figure out where Joel 
Palm Beach should go when Ben is not going to shoot outside? Should he stay inside? She's pick and pop. Like they're still figuring that out. And Ben, Brett Brown flat out said, he goes, look, I was with the Spurs when Tim and Manu and Tony had to figure out how they three were going to play together. And that's where we are with Ben and Joel. They're so good and they got to grow them together. Yep. So just because they're not friends off the court doesn't mean they can't be great on the court. And you, all those stats you see, that's just scratching the surface. Exactly. And you look at, let's talk specifically about Joel and mm-hmm. B's journey back from injury. Oof. 32 and 16 and a career high 36 <laughs> minutes. Where is the process when it comes to his process at this point? Okay, so I've been watching them very closely for about a week now. We were out on the road last week, so they here the other night against the Clippers. He's about 50%. Okay, which is crazy because he went for 32 and 16 the other night, right? And I mean, if you watch him though, he's huffing and puffing up and down the court. He's sweating. Like he's actually getting his shot blocked. I saw him get his shot blocked three times last game. And so you, when he's in shape, that's not going to happen. And that's why each game he plays, they let him go a little bit more, a little bit further. But the issue with Joel always is going to be he wants to go 100,000 percent, and they've got to kind of stop him from himself, sort of keep him patient. That's why the other the other night in Utah, they didn't even send him to Utah. To just stay home, rehab, get yourself right. But he's like 50% of where he needs to be. He needs what? a whole other month of playing to really be in That's shape. That's scary. 50% of where he needs to be. And they're not even whole as a team. Markel yep. Fultz still coming back. <laughs> Shout know. out to Robert Covington, by the way. Yep. Pay that man, Philadelphia. He's, <laughs> he's about for extension to. Today. Pay that man. <laughs> Thank you so much for earning your money, Ramona Shelburne. We appreciate you. got it, you. guys. Fake the humanity on that. That's right. You get the bag and fumble it. I get the bag and flip it and tumble it. We see you, Austin P. Getting hyped for hard in the paint. What are they doing? I don't know. I, I, I don't, look at the, the okay. Yeah, Is that yeah. a new dance? I don't know, but I would like to learn it. <laughs> in the 2003 NBA draft, Duke, Blue Devil, <laughs> Dante Jones selected 20th <laughs> overall by the Celtics. I brought you here to really break down Duke beating Michigan State. No, you didn't. But then again, I wanted to go through your career. Though. You traded to the Grizzlies, you played four seasons in Memphis, ended up playing 13 seasons for eight different teams, your final two spent in Cleveland, and you won a title in 2016. Took you back down memory lane. You still look the same. You ain't used to bit. No, you really? The hair. Now, during last year's run to the finals, bro, did you really rack up $9,000 worth of fines <laughs> during the postseason uh, when you only made $9,127? What are you doing with the extra one hundred twenty-seven? That's a half truth. That's a half truth. Okay, what's the whole truth? Okay, well, you know, you're only counting a portion of my salary. So my regular season salary was made. I'm not counting your pockets at all. No, I'm no, no, I'm saying, but, but there's a there's called a playoff bonus that's way bigger than what we know or what you may know. So okay. that okay. regular season yeah. one game salary was that, but the rest of it you don't know. Oh. So it was worth it. It was worth it. Did your job. <laughs> <laughs> the analogy I give that if somebody ran up on her and started talking crazy to her, what would you do? Would you Absolutely. stand by and say anything, regardless of yeah, if yeah. you're in the game or not? Yeah, you would yeah. say something back, and that's all I did. No okay. doubt. And LeBron did. covered you, correct? No, but okay. it, it wasn't his responsibility. <laughs> like I wasn't, I wasn't looking for him too. No, right. I, paid, I paid my own fines. Okay. So the Cavs have they, they had 500 right now. You know they beat you know Knicks and Mavs lately. I think they won three out of four, or whatever. Going for their third straight tonight against Charlotte. Wondering, do they need a little more Dante Jones? That was missing right now. We know they're missing IT and Tristan Thompson. <laughs> need a little more edge. It's it possible. No, yeah. um, no, they just in the process of growing and learning and, and, and learning what what kind of team, what's our identity as a team and. It's just a, it's a process. It's a process to be great, and I would rather them go through that now than at the end of the season and, and go through those trials and tribulations. It's not just you. It's obviously Kyrie on the offensive end. It's Richard Jefferson's veteran presence not there, and obviously integrating new guys. Like, just elaborate a little bit more on that process. Like, we take for granted when, when a guy like LeBron goes seven straight years to the finals. It's right. like, okay, he's automatic manifest destiny to reach the, reach the, uh, the NBA finals. But it's not that simple year to year. What's some of those – some of the, some of the uh, underrated aspects of gelling as a team. Gelling on a personal level, gelling on a defensive level with a shortened training camp, that's, that's tough too. And then the seven guys integrated into the system and showed how the Cavs do it rather than what you've been doing over your career. And that's tough, and that's going to take time. It's, it's, it's just like I equate it to like Miami. Miami wasn't ready game, first 10 games of the year. It's the first Nine and 14, eight, right? right. Yeah. It's the first 14 games. They're learning their roles. Jay Crowder's learning how he's going to help that team. It's going to be different than how he helped Boston or how he helped Dallas. Um, Derek Rose, you have to integrate Isaiah Thomas and find out where he's going to pick his spots at. So Tristan Thompson hasn't been there. So the integral parts are not there, but they're also learning their roles and learning how they're going to help each other out. And it's, it's just it's going to be a process like any other season. It's, they're not going to come out the gates and just be 20-0. and 0. Then it wouldn't be it wouldn't help their overall growth process if, if they did that. Well, everybody's growth process is different, and clearly it's very different with Boston. I think a lot of people thought that once Gordon Hayward went down and he was hurt that – 
you know, we all kind of lowered our expectations for this team. But you look at what they're doing now, 12-game win streak, uh, look fabulous. Kyrie looks great. Um, are they right now? I know it's the regular season. Everything is still early, including for the Cavs. But do they look like the type of team that can – seriously beat the Cavs when it comes down to playing for something meaningful meaningful in my opinion no but that's mm. that's just what it is at that but why point. not I guess because they have a they have a mix of, of young and, and seasoned and 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 growing <laughs> talent but I don't think they can beat them in a seven game series I think yeah. they're they're doing well right now they're getting better they're they're playing well right now but play all right basketball now is different not animal. you want to play your best basketball you want to you be playing your best basketball in in March, April ish. Is right peaking too early? I, I, I think they're they're going to peak early, but maybe they may be able to hold it down. They they have they're going to have a different journey than everybody else. So yeah. we'll, we'll we'll see. But you can't rate them now where they're going to be at the end of the season. Not right, at all. right. That's that's pretty ahead of schedule for rookies mm. to step into the playoffs and play right. like that. But defensively, they look great. Um, so we're not going to waste time talking about the the Sixers. See, here you go. Getting this W. I already know where this is going. Why not? No, I, I mean, I, See, I don't, you should be proud of where your Sixers are. Like, that's, thank that's, you. No, 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 no. I he's am. trying to goad you what? to talk about Michigan State. That's okay. I mean, it's all right. See, I see how you do. You're not, you're not slick. I wouldn't go See, you know, some of us <laughs> actually know about Division One basketball. I only root that's for Duke cool. just to mess with her. Otherwise, I'm, I'm no. Good, good I'm sorry. Good game. Good game. It was a Appreciate great game. it, man. Right. Thank you, Dante Jones. Driving past. A little glide step, man. That was beautiful. Yeah, this is really provocative, <laughs> and it got you guys going too. I, I can tell. That people is literally going hard in the paint. Now it's time to figuratively go hard in the paint. Coach Cal and Maria Taylor shared a moment during halftime last night. Kansas is out hustling us, but I'll say this: really proud of a bunch of Frenchmen. Might have your arm really hard. It's really tight. But <laughs> I'm not your player. I was not offended at all by him grabbing my arm. It was not an awkward moment. We laughed about it and went on about our business. So I hope you can too. But if you can't and you're writing a story, I am not the ESPN reporter. My name is Maria Taylor. Let's go ahead and get it straight. I love my that. mom ain't named me she ESPN was like, what reporter. What you not gonna do? The <laughs> clap. It's called me ESPN reporter. <laughs> now this was a, a great moment, but yeah. I love how she politely checked everybody at yeah. the end. But they got a relationship. He's yeah, a big deal it about does. it. You know? Good moment by Maria. Great game, too. Both of them were great games, despite the fact I was great unhappy. Great guy college basketball. How one of them turned out. All right, James Harden uh, showed up looking like a highlighter. Are well, we going to show some highlights? <laughs> and Damn. Damn. Do have plenty of highlights. What was that? So 38, that. and that's like 38 steps he took with that Euro step. <laughs> I love that Marty Rosen sticking with tradition. But that Euro step, that's like an intercontinental Euro step right there. Uh, it was a little much. Raptors win. <laughs> they did, and they also won here on, on social, social media. media. Mm-hmm. Yeah, by... Uh, Showing a beardless James Harden, which I don't even remember what that looks like. Me neither. Like. The only yeah. Arizona State remembers that. <laughs> yeah. uh, by the way, you remember Chris Paul? He I plays do. plays for the Rockets. Rockets, I think, 12-4 and four without him. He is going to be back tomorrow against the Suns. Missed almost a month with a bruised knee after going down the season over. We talked a lot about the Celtics gelling quicker than expected. The Cavs taking time to gel. Mike D'Antoni talked about it today. Like, they got to go through a process of their own now reintegrating Chris Paul, which didn't get off to a great start. When he, you know, when the season first started. Yeah, well, it, it is an interesting thing because they're at the Houston, obviously, off to a whistle at the start of the season, and now they have to readjust mm-hmm. to a player who's as great as Chris Paul. Before we call it a day, tell the people had a good day. All right, it's a good day for you parents out there if you're looking for a Christmas gift because Mattel announced it will make a Barbie model after my girl, Olympic fencer Ifti Muhammad, in two, in 2016, she became the first American to compete in the games while wearing a hijab. Uh, she said, I'm proud to know that little girls everywhere can now play with the Barbie who chooses to wear a hijab. This is a childhood dream come true. Awesome. So, hey, we we'll be buying several. We interviewed the AL Cy Young Award winner earlier. Good day for Max Scherzer. Won his second consecutive Cy Young Award, third of his career. He and teammate Steven Strasburg made it to the third straight season. The two teammates have finished in the top three of the NL Cy Young voting. That's it for the six. Sports Center continues on ESPN News. NBA countdown next. Cavs Hornets at 8 Eastern on ESPN. More energy. Bam. Want an easy way to see if you could save money on car insurance? GEICO gives you three. Call 1-800-947-AUTO. Go online to GEICO.com or stop by the GEICO office nearest you. Three ways you could save 15% or more. We are less than three hours from the third college football playoff rankings, and there's sure to be plenty of turnover. <laughs> Good one, Mike. We'll give you the six's best six teams. The Celtics 
Go for 13 in a row, and this masked man is back from a facial fracture. It means bad news for Brooklyn, but it's about to be business as usual so far as Kyrie's concerned. The process produced 32 and 16 last night. I'll ask Bill Self whether he knew Joel Embiid would grow up to be this good and whether his Jayhawks can counter Kentucky's size tonight on ESPN. LiAngelo Ball and two of his UCLA teammates presently on a flight home from China. What's on the horizon as far as their immediate college basketball futures? And we got planes and we got trains on the six. LeBron took the subway and took it to the Knicks. Jerry Jones says he wants to slow down the Roger Goodell extension train. And oh yeah, Oscar's training to fight Connor. How's that for doing too much? Okay, who you are, King, what, what do you call yourself, King, Queen, Princess, whatever you are. And here are tonight's six at six. You know how we do, and you know I'll show plenty of love to my Sixers before shows in, but let's start the best 60 minutes of your day with Mass Kyrie, the best Kyrie with apologies to Untuck Kyrie. Before the game today, he said he looks the best because he looks like the Dark Knight. Irving gets it deep in the corner. Fires up a three and puts it in. This kid is a lethal shooter. The masked man putting on a show. Irving down the lane. Get that masked man. He is enjoying the bright lights of Madison Square Garden. His first 40-point game of his career. I think it's an easy bet to make that it'll be the last. This kid is incredible. Now that was the first of three 40 plus point games for Mass Kyrie, who suffered a fracture below his right eye when he was inadvertently elbowed by teammate Aaron Baines in Boston's win over Charlotte Friday night. Missed Sunday's win over Toronto, but is back against Brooklyn tonight. So one night after LeBron put on the show on Broadway, Kyrie gets to play Phantom of the Opera, if you will, at Barclays Center. Just the opening act, though, says he expects to be masked for a couple of weeks. Here's Kyrie, mask off. I hate wearing it, but uh, somehow it's caused the craze uh, on Instagram and, uh, as well as social media. It's just a masked, masked man. I, uh, you know, but I understand that it's just for my safety. So, um, you know, throwing a mask or for a few weeks and go about my business. My old friend Chris Forsberg covers the Celtics for ESPN.com, and he is in Brooklyn. Celtics going for 13 in a row, powered by the best defensive efficiency and opponent field goal percentage since October 20th, as you know, Chris. From an insider's perspective, what's the story of this 12-game run? Michael, to me, the story has been Brad Stevens. You think about it, when Kyrie goes out on Friday night against Charlotte, they don't have Kyrie, they don't have Al Horford, they don't have Gordon Hayward. That's $77 million worth of talent on the sideline. I'm looking at Boston's bench. They've got six rookies, a guy who was overseas in Europe, and they're down 18 points, and yet Brad Stevens finds a way to push all the right buttons and get the team to come back and win that game. I marvel. It's like, again, the, the, uh, Kyrie Irving and Al Horford have been spectacular, and the younger guys like Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown have really stepped up in big situations. But Brad has just pushed all the right buttons. This team really could have really rolled over when they lost Gordon Hayward and they lost those first two games. But Brad's dialed up all these right things. He kept these guys motivated, and they found a way to win. Yeah, and Danny Ainge looks great for trading down for Jason Tatum. Clutch as he has been. You want to talk about stepping up in big moments. Starts with him. Now, I mentioned Mass Kyrie. We know that he can get buckets with or without it. He's the story of his return tonight. However, there were doubts. There have been doubts about his ability to be a consistent defender. What part has he played in the C's D, and what, if anything, is he doing differently at that end of the floor? You know, it's funny, Michael, is he was on his way to his first meeting with Brad Stevens after getting traded to Boston, and his car broke down, put diesel fuel in a new engine, I and remember got that. stuck in Bentley University in Waltham. And so he shows up a little late. Brad's okay with it. Hey, you gotta, gotta, gotta give your uh, new superstar a little slack. But he says, hey, Kyrie, here's our tape. Here's what we do defensively. All you have to do is be in the right spots, and everything else will take care of itself. And when you got Al Horford behind you protecting that back line, things get a little bit easier. But, you know, Kyrie is just, listen, he's bought in. He's been willing to be an active defender and just be in the right spots, and that's translated to, to very good defense. And, you know, listen, they need that motivation. The younger guys see that, and they want to step up as well. We're looking for some great offense from Mass Kyrie tonight. He had three 40-point games as a Cavalier. First Mask opportunity. Uh, in a Celtics uniform. Chris Forsberg always bringing it with the knowledge. We appreciate it. With a win, Boston will break a tie with the 06-07 Mavericks for the longest win streak by a team immediately following an 0-2 or worse start to a season, according to the Elias Sports Bureau. Uh, Golden State on Thursday, looking forward to that. Then a three-game road trip to Atlanta, Dallas, and Miami after that. But let's not look past an improved Brooklyn Nets team. 
Jerry Jones. Can't stop, won't stop, uh uh-uh. Oh, y'all thought this was a game. The Cowboys owner and GM said he will not back off the threat of suing the NFL and several other owners if the compensation committee comes to an agreement with Commissioner Roger Goodell on an extension. Jones also said he has not received any cease and desist notices from the competition committee, contrary to yesterday's New York Times report. Here's more of what Jones said today. Roger has almost 18 months. He has 18 months left on him. We've got all the time in the world to uh, evaluate uh, uh, what we're doing. Uh, We've got all the time in the world to extend him. Uh, We just need to slow this train down and uh, discuss the issues at hand in the NFL. NFL insider Jim Trotter is here now. So, Jim, it's easy to just dismiss Jerry Jones as being a troublemaker and trying to flex his his power, his muscle, (laughs) but... Does he have a point about wanting to slow down this process? Why is the league so eager to get Roger Goodell extended with 18 months left on his deal? You know, it's interesting, Michael. I asked that exact question to Joe Lockhart, the league's chief communications executive, and he said that the owners, when they went forward with trying to extend Roger's contract, had one thing in mind, and that's that they had several milestones on the horizon that they knew they needed to address. Number one, They knew that the collective bargaining agreement was going to expire or was due to expire after the 2020 season. Two, they also have network TV deals that are set to expire after the 2021 and 2022. And so the owners, there was a sense that it was best to get Roger locked up past those milestones to be able to address that. The other thing here, Michael, too, is precedent. Roger's contract has been extended twice, once in 20 or once in 09 and once in 2012. On both occasions, he had at least a year and a half left on his deal. So that's part of this as well. Let's stay with the train analogy and slowing the train down, pumping the brakes. This negotiation seems like from a public perception standpoint, is kind of on the verge of becoming somewhat of a train wreck. I just wonder, once this extension, assuming it does get done, Jim, has the damage already been done as it relates to the overall harmony in that room of owners as it relates to their collective support of Roger Goodell? But, you know, Michael, we've seen this. uh, This has been on in the works for a while now. You go back to the L.A. situation where folks felt the commissioner should have been stronger in terms of handling that situation. Jerry Jones was the one who basically struck that deal for Stan Kroenke to go from St. Louis to L.A. There have been a number of issues here with Roger that some owners have concern about, whether it was domestic violence, whether it's personal conduct among players and how he handles that, whether it's the L.A. situation. I can tell you this, even prior to Jerry Jones coming out publicly Mm -hmm. and trying to slow the train down here, there were owners who said to me back in March, be on the lookout, Roger may have to earn his money now, meaning that some of his money would be put in incentives instead of guaranteed. So this is not something new. As much as folks want to say Jerry is upset about the Ezekiel deal, which he is, other owners had been talking about this privately as far back as March. Roger getting a little bit of a taste out of other half lives, almost like a player negotiation here. What the good news is you still haven't heard, (laughs) from Roger's perspective, you still haven't heard uh, definitive names as it relates to possible replacements. So you're right, maybe it's just par for the course for a very complicated negotiation. Jim Trotter, appreciate the insight, man. Uh, Topic number three, take three, third college playoff rankings released tonight on ESPN. Alabama, the likely top team given Georgia's loss, but who's number two? We could see a record rise up the rankings if it's Miami, last week's number seven. Last week's number five, Oklahoma beat six-ranked TCU, so they've got a solid case as well. Coming off an impressive win over Iowa due to Badgers crack the top four as one of three remaining unbeaten Power Five teams. Ohio State went from getting curb stomped by Iowa to beating the brakes off of Michigan State. They can clinch the Big Ten East this weekend and will probably face Wisconsin in the Big Ten title game. Where do the Buckeyes land and do they actually still have a shot at the playoff? But perhaps the weekend's biggest winner, Auburn. How much respect does knocking off last week's top team get the Tigers tonight? Keep in mind, no two-loss team has been ranked in the top six this early, but Auburn looks like it's going to change that. Here's the moment you've all been waiting for. My top six, don't at me. Alabama, Clemson, I continue to say, worst loss with all the respect to Syracuse, but best excuse, losing Kelly Bryant. That Auburn win looks so much better this week than it did before. I got Miami at three, Oklahoma at four, and just on the outside looking in, Wisconsin and Auburn. You are now looking at Booger McFarlane, who joins me now from Chicago. Booger, what's your top six? For me, I'm going to start with Alabama number one. I got Miami number two after that big win against Notre Dame. 
I'm going to bump Oklahoma up to number three after beating TCU. Number four for me are the Clemson Tigers. I think the Kelly Bryant injury is helping them out because the committee is not holding that loss against them. And then really quick, Michael, five and six for me, Wisconsin at five, Auburn at number six. I think the Auburn Tigers have everything left in front of them after beating Georgia. Now you get Alabama in the Iron Bowl and then another opportunity against Georgia again. They have a chance to be three top ten teams in a matter of four weeks. That's unheard of. So you're saying a two-loss Auburn team, you can certainly see – getting in, given their remaining schedule and given the way they're rolling right now. So if a two-loss Auburn team, that means, as you mentioned, they will have beaten Alabama in the Iron Bowl two weeks from now. That point spread has already done this. It's shrunk. So if Auburn is in, does that definitively mean that Alabama is out? Uh, In other words, can we go ahead and get rid of the idea of two SEC teams in the top four when it's all said and done? Well, I don't think you get rid of it, but, but I do think the conversation would then come down to an 11-1 and Alabama team. And let's just go look in the ACC. Let's say Miami finishes out the season, regular season, undefeated, and Miami loses to Clemson in the ACC title game. Then you have Clemson in the playoff, and now you have a 12-1 and Miami team. And if those two scenarios happen... Who are you putting in? Are you putting an 11 and 1 Alabama team in with all the pedigree and everything that they have, or are you putting a 12 and 1 Miami team that has a huge <laughs> win against Virginia Tech, an even better win against Notre Dame? I'm not saying that Alabama is done, but I think in that scenario, the committee might lean toward Miami because of that big win against Notre Dame. Booger, I, settle something for me and, and my staff because we've been arguing about this all day. My, I had smoke coming out of my ears. I get a headache with all these scenarios that you college football experts put forth when it comes to (laughs) what might happen. College football is the most cross that bridge when we get to a sport there is because last week it was like, oh, Wisconsin going to get left out, two SEC teams, and then Georgia loses. Oh, Notre Dame, the Independence is going to crack. Then Notre Dame loses. It's like it will all play itself out, and somebody's going to get played, but it will all play itself out on the field as it always does, right? Why do we worry about what's happening two and three weeks from now? Well, because I think, Michael, we're a week-to-week society. Everyone is a prisoner <laughs> of the moment. Now, who's going to be in the top four tonight? Realizing that the season doesn't end for a couple of weeks. So I understand what everybody's doing. Is it funny hey, to you? Think about this, Mike. If you we like just, it? No, it, it's, it's <laughs> absolutely great because guess what? I got a job tonight. So at halftime, or excuse me, in between the two games tonight, because we want to see – up to the minute information, you're going to see me out there, and we're going to be talking about the top four. If we just waited till the end of the season, right. I wouldn't have a job. So stop trying to put me no, out of a I'm job. Not at all. Look, I, I'm, I'm dependent on it too. <laughs> I need people to watch this ranking show too. We're all dependent on the bottom line. So yes, please watch the ranking show and watch more expert analysis from Booger McFarling about rankings that will be moot points <laughs> as the weeks go on. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. <laughs> UCLA freshman Leangelo Ball, Cody Riley, and Jalen Hill, who had been detained in China for the past week on suspicion of shoplifting, are headed back to the United States. Delta's flight tracker currently shows that two planes departed from Shanghai at around the same time Tuesday night local time. Both are scheduled to arrive at LAX at around 5 Pacific. UCLA will hold a news conference tomorrow with Ball, Riley, Hill, head coach Steve Alford, and athletic director Dan Guerrero. Uh, Pac-12 Commissioner Larry Scott said in a statement that the matter has been resolved to the satisfaction of the Chinese authorities and we are all very pleased that these young men have been allowed to return home to their families and university. I believe that press conference will be seen on ESPN News tomorrow at 2. Uh, Jeff Goodman is in Chicago for the Champions Classic. Do we have Jeff Goodman? There he is. Uh, We'll circle back to Duke, Michigan State later on, Jeff. But as for UCLA, what's next for these players? Well, they're going to have a news conference tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. And generally, if you're going to have a news conference, it's not going to be to dismiss these players. There's going to be some sort of suspension announced likely tomorrow morning uh, with these three guys, Leangelo Ball, uh, Cody Riley, and and Jalen Hill. I spoke to Jalen Hill's father earlier today. He didn't want to comment on the situation, but you could just sense the relief, Michael, that he had in his voice because he wasn't over in China. And just the fact that his son is back here after hearing everything that could have happened, and now again with Trump getting involved, uh, with with Alibaba getting involved, certainly some heavy hitters, these kids are back and they're going to be on U.S. soil soon. All right, we'll certainly react plenty to that tomorrow. Again, that press conference carried live tomorrow to Eastern on ESPN News. And Jeff Goodman, uh, since you're so plugged into the Ball family, I want to keep it all in the family and talk Alonzo Ball, who went 3 for 10, 7 points, 5 assists, 5 rebounds, 2 steals, 4 turnovers, and 0 burn in the fourth quarter as Luke Walton rode with Jordan Clarkson and Corey Brewer to get the win, ending a three-game losing streak, getting the win in Phoenix 
Lonzo said, we got to win, so I got no complaints. He's obviously got a lot of pressure, a lot of expectations, a lot of comparisons, unfair and invalid comparisons to the Magic Johnson and Jason Kidds of the world. So maybe this is just old school kids sitting and learning while the vets take home the win. Jeff, how big of a deal is this that Lonzo sat for the fourth quarter last night, a game after being the youngest player ever to record a triple-double? You know, not a big deal. I mean, he's going to be out there. He's still the cornerstone, the franchise player for the L.A. Lakers going forward. But I think Luke Walton certainly sends a message. Uh, And it's twofold. I mean, listen, he wants to see Lonzo Ball be more aggressive, get into the paint, make things happen. But when talking to people around the league, part of the problem here, Michael, is the cast that Lonzo Ball has around him. He's obviously a facilitator, doesn't have a ton of guys yet that can consistently make shots. Sure, Brandon Ingram can do it at times. Uh, Sure, we've seen Kyle Kuzma do it early in his NBA career, but what Lonzo Ball needs, he needs guys that can make shots around him in order for him him to be consistently effective. Especially when he's not making his. Hey, Jeff Goodman, we'll talk to you later on about tonight's Duke-Michigan State game. Meanwhile, it's been 19 days since the Yankees parted ways with Joe Girardi, and the Bombers are showing Aaron Judge-like patience in finding a replacement. Helps that there are no other managerial openings. The Yankees have already interviewed Eric Wedge and Rob Thompson. Uh, Hensley Mullins reportedly has an interview on Friday with ESPN's own Aaron Boone soon to follow. And then there's the possibility of the newly retired Carlos Beltran. Buster only. Buster, what it is right now. How long is this search going to last? Well, Mike, I think you laid it out perfectly. The fact that the Yankees aren't competing against any team, I I think has given them the the feeling that, look, we don't have to rush through this. I do think probably sometime before the winter meetings, they'll have their manager in place. Carlos Beltran is someone they have great respect for. You wonder if the timing is going to be right with him just having retired. He might want to take some time off. Hensley Mullins and Aaron Boone are two serious candidates. Mullins, uh, who's the bench coach of the Giants right now, very respected, knows a lot of languages, really connects with players. And Aaron Boone, to me, is a clone of Terry Francona from a baseball family, connects with people, has a great sense of humor, and is very open-minded to analytics. All right. Uh, Meanwhile, at the winter meetings, the GM meetings in Orlando, the buzz is Giancarlo Stanton of the Miami Marlins, at least for now. Of course, coming off that 59 homer season, most of any player since 2001, tied for the ninth most in Major League history, but has that gargantuan contract. I always love that word gargantuan. So so rare you get to use it in a sentence. Um, What are you hearing about the Marlins asking price? Is it matching in its gargantuan-esque It is absolutely matching in his massive size. And look, they've had conversations with a number of different teams. Right now, it looks like the Cardinals and the Giants are probably the teams that have expressed the most interest to this point. But trading Stanton is such a complicated issue because of the contract size. $295 million over 10 years. Oh, by the way, he can opt out after 2020. Oh, by the way, he has a full no-trade clause. And that's why I'm hearing from a lot of teams, look... Uh, The asking price at this point for the Marlins is not realistic. It's not in touch with reality. Here's something that's been surprising so far in this conversation for me uh, is that there's been very little contact between the Marlins' new ownership and Stanton, who they need to get to agree to a deal. (laughs) And I'm surprised they're not wooing him because at some point they're going to bring some deal for him to veto or accept. So everything is just fine. Uh, Busta Oni is in the house with the knowledge (laughs) as always. We appreciate it, brother. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to GEICO. I'm so happy, I feel like I can fly. Disclaimer, you will not be able to fly by switching to GEICO. This is against the laws of physics and nature. If you find yourself flying, please seek professional and or medical help immediately. In the unlikely event you find yourself flying, you might be a superhero or a pigeon or a superhero named Pidgewoman who was bitten by a radioactive pigeon. If you are indeed Pidgewoman, GEICO retains all licensing publishing rights in the event Pidgewoman the movie becomes a top-grossing Hollywood blockbuster. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The Champions Classic is a tremendous tip-off to the season. You look at the teams that are in it with Duke, Kansas, Kentucky, and us, I mean, that's rare air. And the title has returned to its old Kentucky home. Playing the level of teams that are in this field, it's the ultimate challenge. Michigan State has won the national championship. Mike Krzyzewski, we've had some wars that they've won more of than we have. The best characteristic from each one of them would be a level of maintaining a program. Duke is back the top college basketball.
basketball's elite. Each program has its own culture, and there are a lot of outstanding ones. You learn from being with those guys. Kansas, they are now your national champions. We have three of the pillars of our profession, and Coach Krzyzewski, Coach Izzo, and Coach Calipari. You know, I steal from everybody. These are three that I stole a lot from. We're lucky to be coaching college basketball. We also know that everyone's not going to win. Yeah, you know, the holy grail goes to one. All right, basketball insider Jeff Goodman rejoins me. My man covers the NBA, college basketball, international diplomacy, whatever you need. Uh, speaking of tonight's doubleheader, let's start with uh, Duke, Michigan State. What's the buzz within the NBA scouting community heading into that game, given all the prospects that will be on the floor tonight? Yeah, I mean, Michael, you got so many. It starts with Marvin Bagley from Duke. He could be the number one overall pick. Wendell Carter on the front line with him. A top 10 pick. You got a couple more guys. Marquise Bolden, also 6'11, first round pick. Trayvon Duval, point guard. And then on the other side for Michigan State, Miles Bridges comes back to school as a sophomore, and he could have been a lottery pick last year. The really intriguing one, the one that a lot of guys are talking about right now, is Jaron Jackson Jr. He's 6'11. His dad played at Georgetown, was a guard years ago. But a lot of NBA guys really intrigued with him, and they also want to see how Duvall plays for Duke because he's a guy who came in with a lot of hype but hasn't looked good in the preseason but has looked good in their first two games against subpar competition. All right, and going to the nightcap, Kansas and Kentucky. I'll talk to Bill Self about the Jayhawks in a second, so I'll ask you about the Wildcats. Um, Haven't come out of the gates, you know, firing on all cylinders. I think Calipari has gone with two different lineups in each game, all freshmen, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Why is this U.K. team different than previous uh, Cal incarnations at Kentucky? You know, Cal always says, you know, we're the youngest team in the country, and usually you look at them, they're like 8th or 10th or 15th. But this time he's right. I mean, they are the youngest in terms of inexperience. They start five freshmen, as you said. But the bigger thing for this Kentucky team They do not have a superstar. Every year from the first time he got to Lexington, when he had John Wall and DeMarcus Cousins, they've had that guy. And right now, they don't have it. They've got Kevin Knox, who's a good player. They've got Hamidi Diallo, who's a good player. Who's going to turn into that lottery pick, that guy that they can give the ball to, games on the line to make a play? That's the key for this Kentucky team. Who steps forward, if anybody, because if not, they're going, to, they're going to rely on balance, and I'm not sure that's going to be enough to get to the Final Four. All right, Jeff Goodman with the knowledge from the State Farm Champions Classic. It's early, but this might be the best night of college basketball, at least in the regular season. So Better settle be. in and enjoy it. A couple old friends get together tonight on ESPN. Bill Self and John Calipari, one of three coaching counterparts that have met twice in the national championship game. First in 08 when Cal was still at Memphis. Shout out to Mario Chalmers. Uh, four years later, Calipari was in his third season at Kentucky when Anthony Davis and the heavily favored Wildcats won the school's eighth national championship. And tonight, they meet for the sixth time as AP-ranked opponents since Calipari arrived in Lexington, third most among non-conference matchups in that span. All right, and it's my pleasure to welcome in Kansas head coach Bill Self, joining me as he gets set to tip off against Kentucky in a few hours in the State Farms Champions Classic over on ESPN. Coach, obviously, first and foremost, you're looking to beat a good, although young, Kentucky team, talented as usual. But besides the win, what do you hope to learn about your team with an early season test such as this? Well, I I think see how we can play with poise, see if we can – Understand it's a long game and not let any situation in the game, you know, affect next play. And 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 uh, but there's there's a lot of things. I, I think our toughness level. I think, you know, rebounding the ball certainly against a, a team of that size and that length will will certainly be a, a, a big challenge for us. But we're going to need, you know, uh, good guard play from 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 Malik and and uh, 
and from Legerald, Sfi, and, and, and Devontae. And if we're able to get that, you know, done, then, then uh, I would think that that, uh, uh, that would even the playing field quite a bit, even though they are much longer. You're Jayhawks. You guys are going, as you know, uh, for your 14th straight regular season Big 12 title. That would be an NCAA record for most consecutive regular season conference titles. Now, needless to say, at Kansas, uh, a conference title, that's always one of your goals for the season. But how much do you all discuss the possibility of making history? Uh, I don't even know that we will. I, I think the media will probably take care of that for us. <laughs> That's uh, what I'm here for. But I think subconsciously, uh, there is some hidden pressure that you don't want to be the team not to do it. Yeah. But I just want this team to win their first this year. There you go. Uh, one in a row um, for this year's Jayhawks right. team when it comes to the Big 12. Speaking of the good players you've had come through, Lawrence, my favorite player nowadays is Joel Embiid, the process. I'm not sure how much you get to watch him these days. But did you know, you had him for a short time, but did you know that he'd be this good, as in potentially all-time great big man good? Uh, I actually did. Uh, I, I remember going to a Hall of Fame event in Springfield about three years ago, and I was talking to Calvin Murphy, and uh, he didn't know me. And uh, I said, hey, I coached this big guy this past year that, that people are saying is like Hakeem. And, I think he is. I, th I think he is, but he's bigger. There's so many similarities from his footwork. You know, seven foot two now, and 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 uh, he's grown. You know, he just got to stay healthy and be able to, you know, you know, play 75 games a year. And if he's able to do that, I, I do think that in time he'll go down as one of the best big men ever to play. He's also got one heck of a sense of humor. Did you know that he grew up to be yeah, a part-time yeah, comedian off the court and on the court sometimes? We thought he was. You know, with us. He, he only understood English if, if it benefited him. If, if, if somebody said something like a coach that didn't benefit him, oh, coach, I don't understand at all. Uh, you know, but, but uh, uh, he's got personality, uh, and he's, he, he, he is very, very, very bright, and, and he gets it. And so my little talks with, this, with the Sixers have been, uh, you know, he's totally captivated the city, and, and, and uh, they expect big things and selling the place out. And a large part is due to his personality. Awesome. Well, we appreciate the time, Coach Self. Good luck tonight against Kentucky and look okay. forward to talking to you down the road as you chase that 14th, I, I beg your pardon, that first in a row uh, Big 12 regular season yeah. title. Thank you, Coach. In case you missed it, don't worry, I got you. Here's who I've got in the top six. Bama, Clemson, I test, worst loss, best excuse, uh, Miami, Oklahoma, with Wisconsin, and Auburn just on the outside uh, looking in. Again, don't at me or do. Either way, either way. Uh, now I got Joey Galloway. Joey, what's your top six? Uh, I'm gonna start with Alabama, even okay. though they looked a little sluggish on defense against Mississippi State. Uh, then I'll go Oklahoma. Um, after them, Clemson, Miami, um, Wisconsin, and then I'll take Auburn at number six. I like that order though. That's 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 a different order than I've seen earlier. But you got Alabama number one. That's the expectation. Any chance the committee throws a bit of a curveball and, say, puts Miami all the way up to number one? I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I, I would be surprised. I, I guess Oklahoma is a team that has knocked off Ohio State on the road. Uh, they beat Oklahoma State, uh, and then they just beat number six TCU. So resume. I think if anybody has an argument in this whole thing, yeah, it would be Oklahoma. I would never get on the committee because, honestly, because Miami and, and Clemson will eventually play each other and the winner will get in. To me, it doesn't matter where those two teams are ranked in the top four right now. All right, so you got Wisconsin at number five. I talked about this with Booker McFarlane earlier. Yes. Like, last week's storyline was Barry Alvarez saying an undefeated Power Five conference champion who ne could, should never be left out of the playoff. And it was like, well, will there yeah. be two SEC teams? Will the independent Notre Dame get in? And Georgia and Notre Dame both lost. It seems to take care of itself. So I wonder, are people too worried about what would happen with an undefeated Wisconsin team if it wins out being left out? Are people too worried about that right now? I, of course we are because that's what we do. Uh, but uh, at this stage, and I wouldn't have said this last week, but now, if Wisconsin wins out, they will get in. I just mentioned that uh, either either Clemson or Miami is going to lose again, another game. So one of those teams has to come out. And Wisconsin now with, is sitting in a position to knock off Michigan this week, who will be ranked, and then they'll have a shot at Ohio State in the Big Ten championship game. They'll get in if they win out. So with that said, give me a two-loss team or teams 
that has a good chance of ending up in the playoffs. I, I, I imagine you're going to who, who, who might have two losses? I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not going to say Ohio State for you because I don't want to state the obvious, but give me a two-loss team that can get to the playoffs. Well, obviously is Auburn. Uh, honestly, and even though Auburn has two losses, one of them bad uh, to, to LSU, one of them good to Clemson on the road. But if Auburn's playing somebody this weekend, I don't know if there's a team in the country that I am picking to beat Auburn because of what they look like against Georgia. So if Auburn goes on to beat Alabama and then faces Georgia again in the SEC championship game, they can absolutely get into this thing and might be the favorite. They look that good against Georgia this past weekend. What about uh, Ohio State or USC? Any chance of them getting in the playoffs? You, you seem to, it, it seems you, impossible to keep Ohio they, State out of the playoffs for some reason. They could get in, and USC could also get in. I think the loss of Notre Dame has opened this thing up. Uh, the way Notre Dame lost, uh, the way Georgia lost, they're yep. looking so bad. It would be interesting to see tonight how far those two teams drop, and, and that will like, sort of answer this question. But because Ohio State is sitting there, and they'll be top 10 tonight, and USC, uh, they were 12, they'll be top 10 tonight. So those teams are absolutely in this thing simply because uh, surprises have happened, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of football left to be played. The fun is in the fodder. Joey Galloway, we appreciate it. Yo, Clyde called it. How come Walt Frazier knew the scouting report, but the Knicks went and let LeBron play hero in Gotham? Anyway, LeBron basically called Frank uh, Nilakina a mistake and called out Ennis Cantor for coming to his guy's defense. So we should have known it was going to come down to this. I'll say this, the Cavs won the game, but the Knicks won the night because they won a lot of respect. But LeBron won the war of words, though, because he's won a lot. I'll tell you one thing, this team is really special. And you ain't coming to my house playing that water bottle flip game again. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't care who you are, king, what, what do you call yourself, king, queen, princess, whatever you are. You know, we're going to fight. And, and nobody out there going to punk us. Well, I'm the king, my wife is the queen, and my daughter is the princess. So we got all three covered. <laughs> nice hat. Nice comeback from 23 down for 23 and the boys. And nice social media synchronization, guys. Working together swimmingly on IG with the Arthur memes. I'm sorry, I admit it, I don't get it. That's not saying much. Maybe I should get it because I guess it's going to be a thing this year. Meanwhile, you're welcome. You're all welcome, says LeBron on Instagram. King of New York, hashtag my favorite playground. Okay, Frank White, we see you. Um, my takeaway from the past two days, LeBron holds a grudge. He was bored, loves the attention of the theater and the stage. In other words, things we already knew. And you may know that he has now won eight straight games at MSG, 18 and seven there all time with an average of 28 points, seven to six, and six rebounds per game. If he keeps it up, he might be almost as good at social media as Joel Embiid. Did you see my guy go to work last night, play a career high 36 minutes, 32 points, 16 rebounds, and shots at both DeAndre Jordan and Willie Reed. Tonight I just wanted to go inside, especially against uh, DJ and uh, uh, I don't know what's his name, but uh, that both fired out and that was my job today. That means I did a great job on them and uh, they couldn't guard me. So uh, it was it was a great win and uh, we on to the Lakers now. Gift that keeps on giving. Speaking of gifted, Ben Simmons, slight work, 22, 12, boards, seven dunks, most of any player this season. Sixers Lakers tomorrow on ESPN. The homie SVP got an interview with Simmons tonight on SportsCenter. I can't lie, I'm a little jealous. And they don't even have full shit. He's still out here shooting left-handed. You know what they do have, though? Robert Covington, one of the best 3 and D guys and the most efficient catch-and-shoot player in the game, arguably. The poster child for the process. And he's about to get PAID. That's why my moms hate me. Sam Hinkie's undrafted gym. Eligible to sign an extension tomorrow. And Philly is in the process of locking him up. Nice stuff. I'm just going to overlook my Clippers losing six in a row and just shout out my Sixers. Still trusting. Always. Bandwagon, still plenty of room. I don't know if they're happier about advancing to the World Cup, Sweden, and knocking off Italy or knocking out Italy for the first time since 58 or because they are doing too much honorable mention and this is doing too much countdown. That is how you celebrate. That's how you do television. Right there. I should do... Okay, do I have to collapse like that? Are we that cheap? Congratulations. They do? Okay. Rob, I will make sure that I do not dive on the desk anytime soon. All right.
go to Chicago with uh, Bobby Porter's back with his Bulls teammates playing well and following an eight-game suspension for punching Nikola Miritich. Miritich refuses to talk to Portis, and Portis has tried to apologize to Miritich, but Executive VP John Paxson, he basically said that the days of accommodating Miritich are over. See, the Bulls can't trade him until January 15th. The way Portis is playing, they probably don't want to trade him at all, so that's two months of this situation to linger. Paxson is telling Miritich to get over it and move on, and that's easy to say when you're not the guy that got punched in the face by a teammate. So this situation needs resolution somehow, some way. I feel for Meritage, the Bulls, as usual, in a tough spot. Uh, after refusing to back down on Monday, Conor McGregor reversed course and apologized today for his actions last Friday in Dublin, saying, I let my emotions get the best of me and acted out of line. I must hold myself to a higher standard. I kind of saw it as counter countering, like acted out of line. Like I didn't know he had lines. Meanwhile, Oscar De La Hoya says he's been secretly training and proceeded to call out Conor McGregor, saying I'm faster than ever and stronger than ever. I know I can take out Conor McGregor in two rounds. I'll come back for that fight. Two rounds, just one more fight. I'm calling him out. How about, you know, that's going to be a no for me, dog. Because you're trying to get paid because a bunch of suckers out there paid for Mayweather and McGregor, and it turned out better than we thought. No, you're not getting our money for De La Hoya McGregor. Doesn't have the same ring to it. It's not, it's May Mac, it's what is it, Day Mac? No, I, I, absolutely not. Meanwhile, don't shoot me, young blood. I got a girlfriend. I got a wife on the side. Daddy! Daddy! Oh! Say something else. Cam Newton, never boring in press conferences. But you know what? You look good, you play good. He didn't look that good, but he did play well. Going for four touchdowns over against the Dolphins. 95 yards rushing. Panthers, bye week, perfect time to get Olsen back, although they lost Curtis Samuel. Power Rangers on ESPN.com have them as the fifth best NFC team, number 10 overall. They're my third ranked NFC team behind the Saints and Eagles in that order. Before I call it a day, let me tell you we had a good day. It's a good day for Braxton Beverly, who will be able to play for North Carolina State tonight after the NCAA reconsidered and granted his transfer waiver. Finally, the freshman left Ohio State when Thad Mata was fired, but was told he was ineligible because he had taken an early enrollment class there last May. They had twice denied his request. Third time is a charm. That's it for me. Check out the Champions Classic on ESPN, and we will see you tomorrow.